talk about how a child thinks about the Word of God when it hears it uh, in a child's eyes. So let me just read a couple of things to you tonight. In the beginning, which was close to the start, there wasn't anything except God, darkness, and some gas. The Bible says the Lord thy God is one, but I think he's much older than that. <laughs> Anyway, God made the world, and then he said, give me some light, and somebody gave it to him. He split an Adam and made Eve. Adam and Eve didn't wear any clothes, but they weren't embarrassed because God hadn't invented mirrors then. <laughs> Adam and Eve sinned by eating one bad apple, and they were driven out of the Garden of Eden. I'm not sure what God drove them in because he hadn't invented cars yet. <laughs> Adam and Eve's son hated his brother as long as he was able. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, all the people died except Methuselah, who lived to be like a million years old. <laughs> Next one, you know what? Next important person was Noah. He was a really good guy, but one of his kids was a ham. <laughs> <laughs> Noah built a big boat in his backyard and put his family and a lot of animals in it. He asked his neighbors to join them, but they said they would take a rain check. <laughs> Ooh, I, love it. Uh, I love it, I love it. Exodus chapter 35. thought tonight is uh, in the Old Testament uh, the people of Israel were God's people just as the New Testament church are God's people and the only difference between them and us they look forward to the cross when Jesus would come and die we look back at the cross when Jesus actually came and died and that's about the only difference between it's just amazing grace in the New Testament. But uh, God wanted these people to build him a tabernacle. He, uh, of course, he dwelt in a tent where the ark, ark was carried, and uh, his presence was always there with them. But he wanted a tabernacle, a temple, so he could dwell in the Holy of Holies and live among the people. And in Exodus chapter 35, verse 4, Moses spake unto all the children of the congregation of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering from the Lord, whatsoever is of a willing heart, and let him bring it, offering of the Lord gold and silver and brass, now, Moses made it very plain. I don't want you to do anything for God. I don't want you to give. I don't want you to bring anything unless it's a willing heart that leads you to do it. I'm not commanding you to do anything. God's not commanding you to bring a willing offering. You've got to bring it on your own with a willing heart. And we find in uh, Exodus chapter 12, where did the people get all this <coughs> gold and silver which they had? Where did they get that? I mean, they, they were slaves in, uh, in, in Egypt. Where did, where did they get all that stuff? Well, in Exodus chapter 12, in verse 35, the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. Uh, Moses told them, of course God told Moses to pass it on to the people. But Moses told the people, you go to these people that's been subject, and that you've been subject to, and that's been ruling over you, and you've been a slave to, and borrow from them. 
And the Bible says they borrow of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such as they required and they spoiled the Egyptians. They took nearly all the gold and silver they had before they left. And so that's what they had to offer to the <coughs> Lord to build the tabernacle and get this done for God. Now in uh, Exodus 35, uh, let's turn over there just a minute, and I want to share with you uh, in verse 4 and 5 about the tabernacle. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is a thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take you from among you an offering from unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring in an offering of the Lord gold and silver and brass. And let's go on over to verse 5. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people, that's chapter 36, verse 5. And they uh, spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man or woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. Don't, don't make any more curtains and so forth, no more work. So the people were restrained from building, bringing. Can you imagine that? Moses had to tell the people, don't bring any more. We've got enough. And uh, verse 7, for the stuff they had was sufficient to do all the work to make it, and then too much. They had a willing heart. They brought so much that Moses had to tell them to stop. We've got plenty of time to build the tabernacle. And so the thought tonight is a willing heart is an overflow from the Lord. God had blessed these people. He'd been so good to these people, delivered them out of bondage. They're, they've got a light uh, to lead them at night. They've got this uh, light over them at night, keeps them warm. And I like, they, they've got a cloud that leads them by day, and they've got food from heaven coming down. They've got water running out of a rock. Uh, God's blessed them with their goodness. And so I have found that a willing heart that God asks us to have, if we really stop and consider, is an overflow from the Lord. It's an emotion that we receive when uh, we live the Christian life in the light of God's goodness. God has been so good to us, folks, we have to have a willing heart. Oh my goodness, how, how God is so good to us. Uh, he, he provides all of our needs and cares for us in a special way. And so as a result of the overflow of God blessing us and being good to us, then we can have a willing heart. My goodness, how good God has been to us. Amen. A little boy was visiting with his next door neighbor and uh, his, little, his little friend lived there. So the two had been out playing. They came inside the neighbor's boy. Boy's mother pulled out a big cake and cut two big slices and set the boys down and put a cake in front of them. And, <coughs> and then the uh, uh, little boy next door came to play with the neighbor and said, Well, I sure do thank you for this piece of cake. Um, it sure looks good, and I'm thankful that you gave it to us, and I appreciate it, and I thank you for it. And uh, neighbor boy's mother said, my, that's really sweet. My son of mine never thanks me for anything. And the little neighbor boy grinned and said, you put some ice cream on it, I'll thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, uh, that's the way God does us. I mean, he's the cake, 
He's the ice cream. He's everything. Yeah. Uh, he's been so good to us. Amen. And we recognize it's God's goodness providing the cake, the ice cream, and everything else. Amen. Well, do we have a willing heart? <coughs> I'm, I'm asking the Lord to give all of us a, a willing heart. May we retain that willing heart. Amen. A willing heart has to come from an overflow. We have to realize that God is behind everything. Every good thing that's ever happened to us is a result of the giving of God. Amen. God gave it to us. He gave us our food. He gave us the clothes we wear. He gave us the house we live in. He's given us the automobiles we drive. Everything that we have comes from the goodness of God. And we, we understand that. We accept that. And we live on that principle. Everything comes from God. And God is so good to us and has blessed us. Then we can have an overflow. And we can have a willing heart to do whatever needs to be done for God. If we have a willing heart that comes from an overflow, we'll give to our church. Amen. I mean, there's just no way that I could keep from not giving. After God has been so good to me and blessed me. I'm not rich by any means, but I, I'm not hungry. I have a place to sleep. God's been good to me. Amen. How good he's been to me. And we need to feel that overflow. If you feel yourself slipping away from God, start looking at how good he's been to you. Start counting your blessings. And start counting and uh, re receiving his blessings. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good thing I have comes down from God. Amen. Comes down from heaven. 1 Timothy 6.17, <clears throat> he giveth richly all things to enjoy. And if we share with what he's blessed us with, and with a willing heart, we will help feed the kids. And we'll, we'll help feed poor people. We'll help get the gospel out. If we do all those things, I'm going to go home tonight and have my egg sandwich and diet Pepsi and, and make sure that Abby got <laughs> But uh, I'm not going to feel guilty with what God blessed me with. Amen. I'm not, <clears throat> people always try to get me to feel guilty. You know, I get... I bet I got a dozen letters this week, people soliciting, trying to make me feel guilty uh, and send them some money. You know, if God impresses me to send them something, I'll send them something. But don't try to mo motivate me and make me feel bad and make me feel guilty because I don't do something. I know my heart, God knows it, and I'm going to keep it up today, day by day. And I'm going to give by the overflow, knowing that how good he's been to me, I've got to be good uh, in return Amen. and be good in helping others. So if we are motivated by this overflow, we'll be a witness for the Lord. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of the Lord. Amen. I, you know, our best witness that we have is when we go to... Uh, eat at a restaurant or at a store, uh, Chinese uh, <coughs> supermarket, Walmart, and somebody does something good for us or we just feel impressed to hand those thank you tracks out. People appreciate that. But I'm not going to be ashamed of Jesus. We, we have no reason. I, he probably shamed me sometimes, but I have no reason to be ashamed of him. And if I get an opportunity to tell somebody about him, what he's done for me, save my soul from hell, and have prepared a place for me to live with him forever, why should I be ashamed of him? And if I will keep that willing heart, keep this in my mind, this overflow, willing spirit, motivated by God's goodness, He's been so good to me to save me and forgive my sins. Why shouldn't I witness for him? I should witness to him 
for him from this overflow of goodness Amen. that flooded my soul. That's what these people gave from. It was an <coughs> overflow. They realized that God brought them out of Egypt. They'd been slaves for years. And he brought them out rich people with gold and silver and all these blessings. And so they realized that I'm going to heaven because of the goodness of God. Yeah. And so we could Let's, let's operate on this basis. Let's operate on the overflow, uh, the goodness of God that he has so blessed us with. And so if we operate on that, uh, we'll always be willing to give or to witness. We'll be willing to serve in any way that God provides for us to serve. I'm going to serve the Lord by God's grace, as long as it gives me strength to do so, because of his goodness. I'm going to serve, operate under the principle of the overflow from God's goodness. I mean, God's been so good to me, why shouldn't I serve him? Why shouldn't I live for him? Why shouldn't I? If we operate uh, on the basis of this willing heart, it comes from the overflow of God's goodness. If you catch yourself getting cold on the Lord, slipping away from the Lord, as all of us have done, remember <coughs> what he's done for you. And read his word and see how good he is to you and how the gifts he's given you and how he gives you gifts every day. Every give, good gift comes from the from the Father in heaven and operate from the overflow. I know there's times when all of us are tested and tempted and we could say if we can go through this, that, and the other and we have a tendency to focus on our circumstances. But what we must focus on is the goodness of God. Amen. Focus on the overflow that comes from the goodness of God. Every time I start feeling sorry for myself and having a little pity party, the devil comes by and joins with me and lets me know I have every right to have a pity party and he will join right in and rejoice in my pity party. I have to go back and remember how good God is and how good God has been to me. Don't lose that focus. Operate on the willing heart motivated by the goodness of Almighty God. Amen. And uh, are we thankful that God has given us a good church like Ellisburg? I've never met people, and this is from my heart, I've never met people more loving or more giving or more kind than you are. Our offering last Sunday was 1,500 and something this morning. Uh, was 1400 and something and 700 for the mayor and 700 for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I thank God for all of this Amen. that he has bestowed upon us. I, I want to give also. I want to be motivated by his goodness and operate on God. This, this overflow that comes from God. Now, if you can't see God's goodness in your life, you, you've got a problem there, yeah, yeah, yeah. You really do. Because he is good. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're experiencing, God is still good. Amen. He's always good. And um, we need to be willing to obey the Lord's will, whatever it may be. He said, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. If we sit in some school or church and we hear the Word of God being taught and preached and we don't pay any attention to it, we're deceiving ourselves. <coughs> I heard somebody say, well, I went to church. Did you receive anything from God's Word? No. Well, then you might as well stay with the house because the Bible says, be ye hearers, not, not only hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. And what we hear and what we learn in church, God teaches us those things so we will do them. He wants us to do them. He doesn't want us to just sit around and 
soak up everything that he has for us from his word and not apply it. He wants us to do it. Be ye doers of the word. And if we're not willing to do it, we have deceived ourselves. That's the Bible talking, not me. So, the Lord's been so good to us. Uh, let's operate on this willing spirit, this overflow that comes from the goodness of God. If you don't have the overflow, start thanking God. Thank God for your food. Thank God for your clothes. Thank God for your health. Thank God for your uh, automobile, your drive. Thank God for the house you live in. Thank God for the church that he's given us to come and serve in. Thank God for every good thing. Amen. And uh, you'll get that willing spirit. you get it from the overflow that got from knowing that God is so good to us and thanking him for his goodness. The Lord has been so good to us that we shouldn't hesitate to obey Him. I've seen folks that go to the doctor and the doctor tells them, instructs them what they're supposed to do and the medicine they're supposed to take and what do they do? They go home, they, they go to their, uh, wherever they pick their medicine up, they get their medicine they read the bottle, bottle, whatever, how much it tells them to take, when they're supposed to take it. They just obey everything the doc told them to do. But when they go to the Lord's house and hear the word of God, well, I don't have to do that. You know, that, that's just what the preacher said. Or that's just what the Sunday school teacher said. Are we forgetting that this is God's word? Amen. And God says it, not the preacher not the Sunday school teacher. If we're teaching and preaching the word of God, that's not my word, that's God's word. Yeah. And he said, not only be a hearer of the word, you be a doer also. And if you don't, you're deceiving yourself. Deceiving yourself. And uh, we have to be willing to pray. Pray, I, I know that some folks said, well, I can't pray. Yes, you can. Amen. Everybody can pray. And when we pray, we need to pray with a willing spirit. I mean, I'm willing to pray for anybody, anytime. I've had people call me at night. I've had people call me all hours of the day. It doesn't make any difference. If God lays on your heart to have me or somebody pray for you, I'll be willing to pray for you anytime. Amen. But I, and I operate on this willing heart. Is this overflow that comes from the goodness of God. I think of uh, hundreds of people that prayed for me today. And why? That's God's goodness. He, he took somebody's heart to pray for me today. And why shouldn't I be willing to pray for others? Because of the goodness of God. This overflow that comes from the goodness of God. My, my, I've got to pray for I've got to pray for you every day. Why, preacher? Because of the overflow. God's been so good to me. Jesus is praying for me right now. And Jesus is praying for you. He's interceding on our behalf. And he's been placing on the hearts of somebody somewhere to pray for you. I had an individual call me yesterday and they said, I've been praying for you. Anything you need, let me know. If I can do it, I'll do it for you. I mean, God motivated that person to do that and to say that. God, through his goodness, uh, God operates on the principle of overflow. He's so good, he has to keep on giving. God operates on the same principle that he tells us to operate on. Who do you think the principle came from? It came from God. God is good, and he operates on the principle of overflow. He's so good, he has to do all these things for us. Oh, it's amazing when you stop to think about it. God just doesn't say, okay, you obey what I tell you to do. God obeys what he says he's going to do. I mean, he operates on the same principle. Well, we, 
we must pray for each other. And uh, do your praying on the principle of the overflow. God's been so good to you, he's got people praying for you. Why shouldn't we pray for somebody else? Amen. We have to. Folks, we have to operate on the principle of the overflow. Always considering how good God's been to us and pass that on in, in the way that we live the Christian life. Samuel said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. The church should be prayer conditioned as well as air conditioned. Amen. 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 We should pray one for another. Do we do it? Why do we necessarily deserve it? Maybe we don't deserve it. But let's operate from the principle of the overflow. We get it because of the goodness of God. God lays it upon the hearts of people to pray for us because of his overflow. He's so good, he has to uh, pray for us. And he has to inspire, touch hearts to pray for us. That's amazing when we stop to think about it. God doesn't tell me to do anything that he's not already done or in process of doing. He, he knows it according to the word of God. He doesn't break his word in any manner or any way. He keeps his word just like we keep his word or he expects us to keep his word. He obeys his word just like he asks us to obey his word. That's amazing that we have a God that cares for us and so good to us that he operates on the same principle that he wants us to operate on. And the overflow, remembering how good God is and operating on that principle in everything that we do. I want to share this with you. I've had it in my Bible for some time. Christianity is not a solo sport. Two years ago at CN Special Olympics, Nine contestants, all physically or mentally disabled, assembled at the starting line for the 100-yard dash. Now, could you imagine these uh, nine kids, uh, mental and physical? Uh, Lord only knows all the problems they had, and they were going to run this 100-yard dash. At the gun, they all started out not exactly in the dash, but with the desire to run the race to the finish and to win. All that is except one boy who stumbled on the asphalt. He tumbled over a couple of times and began to cry. The other eight heard the boy cry. They slowed down and paused. Then they all turned around and went back. Every one of them. One girl with Down syndrome bent down and kissed him and said, this will make it better. <laughs> then all nine linked their arms and walked together to the finish line. Amen. Amen. Everyone in the stadium stood and the cheering went on for two minutes. Amen. Now that's how a church ought to behave. Amen. Paul reminds us that when one hurts, we all hurt. Why do you think we have these prayer requests? Praying for each other. When one hurts, everybody hurts. That's the reason we're praying for Alan. He's hurting, we hurt. That's why we're praying for Lana. Lana hurts, we hurt. Praying for Bobby, the Bobby's sick, we hurt. If Ron has pneumonia, hurting, we hurt. That's why we pray for each other. Send each other cards to cheer each other up. Use the telephone call. Use visitation. Pray for one another. And if one of our people has a special need, we can meet it. That's what we endeavor to do. We're all one. The church doesn't operate on the solo system. It operates on the family system. We're just a big family. And thank God that we are. Thank God that we're God's family. Amen. And that's the most important thing. Well, we love you. Would you stand with us? And we
just have a closing prayer.